Um, how is everyone? Tired? Some of you are up at 6.30, like me, probably pretty tired. Or perhaps, you know, you got in yesterday, met up with some people for a drink, turned into two drinks, ended up out slightly later than you anticipated. Got up this morning, still made it for the keynotes. A little bit tired. Uh, in the early years of Forest Fringe, we never seemed to sleep that much. If that sounds like a boast, that's because it is. <laughs> or at least uh, it used to be. Uh, Forest Fringe is an organization I run with my friends Deborah Pearson and Ira Brand. For 10 years, we've hosted a free venue at the Edinburgh Festival that hopefully some of you might have visited. Uh, a space for risk and experimentation in the midst of the world's biggest arts festival. And each year, our days at the festival would follow a similar pattern, a pattern which may be familiar to any of you that have run something similar. Uh, we'd begin around 9am, frequently jolting awake with the sickening realisation that we were already late, uh, stumbling through the empty grey streets of Edinburgh to begin clearing the detritus from whatever horrendous party had taken place the previous night beer bottles and wine bottles and empty glasses and other less predictable remains uh, blistering the floor of the venue. Duck feathers, cardboard, tinsel, neon powder paint, tin foil. Remember the tin foil, Joe? Yeah. Circuit boards, bubble wrap, sleeping people. Once this mess was cleared, the artists would begin to arrive to rehearse whilst we mopped floors and unknotted thick, sticky clumps of electrical cabling, finishing just in time to open to the public at about midday. From that point on, we were collecting tickets, moving lights, organizing the queue of people snaking down the stairs to the entrance, persuading passers-by to fill out the gaps in quieter shows, grabbing lunch when we could, an occasional beer to keep you going, smoking thin cigarettes on the steps outside, resplendent in our exhaustion. The shows would run until 1 a.m., sometimes later, and then there were the parties, which would run until 3 a.m. or later, and beyond them, the rest of the Edinburgh Festival reaching out for you with its monstrous, glittering arms. I remember this rhythm, the feel of it, the weight of it. I remember feeling proud of my exhaustion, a humble brag used to elicit sighs of sympathy and respect. Our lack of sleep was evidence of something good about ourselves, even if we couldn't exactly describe what that thing was. Only the tiredness itself, the two or three snatched hours of semi-inebriated rest that I would confess to you with a woozy, bashful boastfulness, a not-so-secret secret we would share whilst I rubbed my eyes and leaned against the bright red doorframe checking the time before the next performance. Um, looking back on those years now, I, I think I can identify two main causes of this curious and misplaced pride. The first is the theatre in London, where I worked in the year before Forest Fringe began. This theatre, like many theatres, inspired an incredible devotion in the people who worked there young people attempting together to realize almost impossibly ambitious projects with the most meager of resources, resulting in a kind of collective relentlessness that was both exhausting and intoxicating. Many people worked late, some almost competitively late, writing emails and funding applications whilst audiences drank and laughed and clapped upstairs eating takeaway food on the theatre steps, all the time nurturing a camaraderie, a shared understanding that for us, at least, this was more than work, and that this must not be the case for those who chose to go home on time. It was in this environment that I learned what I thought it looked like when you really cared about something. It looked exhausted, bleary-eyed but wildly righteous, a look shared across a darkened office, across other people's unattended desks. And lurking somewhere in that look was a judgment that it took me a long time to realize I was making, a judgment about your level of commitment to a project if you weren't willing or able to push yourself to this same unsustainable degree. The second reason for our sleeplessness was the Edinburgh Festival itself. Uh, whilst the Fringe has undoubtedly always been something of a party, 
uh, over the 10 years that we were there, we watched it mutate into something bigger and much more horrifying. <laughs> a month-long, 24-7 wonderland, an astroturfed theme park of bingeable culture and sponsored consumption, stretching from George Square all the way to the Cowgate. A vast Foster's paradise that sits on top of the actual city with all the delicacy of Monty Python's cartoon foot. And as if the literal thousands of bars and venues that make up the festival weren't enough, deep within this plastic fantasia are hidden a daisy chain of pseudo-exclusive VIP areas for artists, journalists, and anyone else the venue is trying to impress, each of which stays open pretty much until the sun comes up. Despite being made up of tents, basements, and other rooms too small or too weird to host actual shows, there is undoubtedly a seductive cardboard glamour to these private bars, enabling us to flash our members' cards or blag our way in and believe for a few fleeting seconds that we are Hollywood royalty. And isn't that feeling, in the end, one of the most important things about a festival like The Fringe for people like us? This life can sometimes be dispiriting, earning very little, performing in tiny fringe theatres, living in shared houses in unglamorous parts of town, it can leave you questioning whether there is any point in carrying on. Feeling like what you do is desired, important even, even if only in the fairy-like phantasmagoria of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, can help you keep going when otherwise you might not. I enjoyed late nights spent feeling like I was important at the Edinburgh Festival. Maybe too much. Striding out into the city from Forest Fringe at three in the morning, disappearing into guest-listed parties or Underbelly's members' bar, a pound shop Joan Crawford living the moderately high life in a festival, if not a city, that never sleeps. Turning back up at Forest Fringe every morning after two or three hours of sleep, ready to take out the recycling and clean mud off the floor, felt both like a righteous demonstration of how much I cared and evidence of how wild and radical and young we obviously were. I don't think I've ever felt as fucking radical as I felt in some of those early years. When in reality, I think I was just really, really tired. <laughs> um, in his book, brilliant book, 24-7, uh, Late Capitalism and the Ends of Sleep, uh, Jonathan Crary describes the slow erosion of the space we make for sleep by the forces of capitalism. At the beginning of the last century, people slept for around 10 hours a night. Now, the average adult in North America sleeps each night for only six and a half hours. How many hours did you have of sleep last night? The cities most of us live in remain in a perpetual state of illumination, with everything from supermarkets to bowling alleys to warehouses and factories operating on 24-7 time. The city forever in motion. Meanwhile, even in the relative quiet of our houses, the blue light emitted by our smartphones suppresses the production of sleep-inducing uh, hormone melatonin, keeping us awake late into the night, faces illuminated in the otherwise dark, moving through virtual shopping malls of infinite size and endless distractions. As Query states, uh, there are now very few significant interludes of human existence with the colossal exception of sleep that have not been penetrated and taken over as work time, consumption time, or marketing time. Work time, consumption time, or marketing time. Which brings us back to the Edinburgh Festival. It's all-consuming fairground of venues, shows, bars, and food stands. It's wall-to-wall -wall posters. Artists propping up its 4 a.m. bars, a thick stack of flyers perpetually weighing down their bags. The Edinburgh Fringe is the internet come horribly to life. A 24-7 city in microcosm, boiled down to its most vivid and compulsive elements. It is where sleep goes to die. <laughs> to query, sleep is important because nothing of value can be extracted from it, and consequently it is our final line of resistance against the apparently irresistible forces of modernization. It is where our conformity to capitalism must end. Indeed, in sleep we reclaim another kind of space. Uh, a space of vulnerability which necessitates care and protection, which demands a kind of social order outside of the vicissitudes of production and consumption. Sleep, then, is not only important because as yet we can't buy anything in it. It is perhaps also the place from which we begin to think about a world outside of capitalism, a space of mutuality, 
community and care uncorrupted by the principles of competition and individualism. To sleep, perchance, to dream. We hoped and still hope for Forest Fringe to also be a place from which to begin thinking about a world outside of capitalism. But we were also young and we mistakenly thought the best way to do so was to stay up as late as we could. We worked until we cried and we went to all the parties, which may seem like opposite things but are perhaps part of the same thing. Part of exactly the set of ideas about the world and how it works that we thought we were resisting. We were resisting those ideas in some ways, but in other ways we were in fact perpetuating them too. And one of the stories of Forest Fringe is the story of that conflict, of our distance from and occasional closeness to the glittering allure of the rest of the festival and the ideology that organizes it. We were and still are finding our, we were and still are finding our way towards something better. And perhaps this talk is about a way in which we stumbled, perhaps even failed, though we try, to not, uh, though we try not to lose too much sleep over it. Thank you.